like defense way of saying, hey, leave me alone, don't mess with me. I'm tough. Jacob just tilt that towel back behind his head. All right, there you go. He's actually clacking his beak. Yeah, just get it behind his head, guys. Mm -hmm. The animal was brought to us. Uh, it was found on the ground. Um, it had apparently fallen out of the nest. So the local uh, Weymouth Animal Control Officer had, had uh, brought it to us. Uh, we did an exam, a uh, physical exam, and we also did some uh, blood work on the animal, found that the animal was otherwise in good health. Uh, it was actually in very good body condition. Uh, it was not dehydrated, and there were no obvious injuries or signs of illness. So our ultimate goal with this animal, because the ultimate goal for wildlife rehabilitation is to get all the wildlife back out into the wild where they belong, is to foster him and or reunite him <coughs> in another nest. So because we know exactly where this owl's nest is, we can actually work with some local wildlife biologists that are actually able to reunite these birds with their parents and get them back to where they belong. So those biologists uh, from the Blue Hills Trailside Museum, uh, Norm Smith and his uh, staff are gonna go ahead and work with us um, here at New England Wildlife Center to actually reunite uh, this owl with his uh, parents so he can actually grow up, learn the proper, um, you know, learn um, proper behavior to be a great horned owl and not become habituated or um, associated with people, which can often cause problems uh, when we're dealing with wildlife. So this lets the owl complete its natural life cycle, which is always a good thing. Um, and we work as a team when we're handling cases like this. So New England Wildlife Center with its veterinary staff and its uh, medical capabilities provides the veterinary medical aspect of the care. Uh, we make sure the animals are healthy, we make sure they don't have any uh, problems with either being injured or uh, sick. And then we work with our other staff uh, from Blue Hills Trailside Museum as well as uh, other organizations to actually get the wildlife back out where they belong. What you can see they're doing here is actually tongue feeding this nestling, which mimics the behavior you're gonna see in the wild. So what happens is in the wild, <laughs> the adult birds will actually capture prey. Um, in the great horns case, they can take anything. They'll take small mammals, they'll take uh, birds, they'll take reptiles. Uh, amphibians um, and they'll go ahead and capture that prey, eat it, and then they can potentially regurgitate it and actually provide that uh, food for their offspring, for their young. So what we're doing here mimics what's, uh, what you would see in the wild. They eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this guy gets about 100, they, 100 grams. Yeah, they are very, very hungry. So l yesterday we actually fed the equivalent of like six mice twice a day, but we end up feeding them about 20% mm -hmm. of their body weight every day at least. Yeah, it's a significant amount of food. And that's because he's a growing, young, healthy outlet. Uh, so they need a significant uh, amount of food each and every day. And if you notice, we're actually feeding the whole animal. So when you feed wildlife carnivores like this, you need to feed a whole prey type diet. So that animal needs not only the muscle meat, but they also need the bones, the fur, the feathers, depending on the type of animal. They need all the organs like the liver, the kidneys, um, stuff like that, because that provides a complete and balanced diet for the animal. So right now we're actually feeding them, I believe it's mice bits. Yeah. Yes. So yes. So we actually have chopped up bits of mice. Um, and you can see we actually have like the whole organs in there. Like I, I just noticed <laughs> demanding. I, I just noticed a uh, bit of liver in there. So yep. But this way we don't end up with any nutritional deficien uh, deficiencies. We don't end up with any health problems. And we make sure they get a uh, complete balanced diet so he can grow, gain uh, gain a good amount of weight, and that way we can f uh, reunite them and put them back in the nest. Because the nice thing about owls is they don't count their kids. So hopefully we're going to be able to reunite this owlet with his original parents. But if for whatever reason we're not able to do that, we can actually foster him in another owl nest. Um, 
So we'll find, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, work with wildlife biologists as part of a team and we can identify other gray horned owl nests that have owlets that are roughly the same size and then we can put him in that group and the adults the vast majority of the times accept them with no problems. Most likely this guy got a little over eager, a, lo a, a little overactive and he kind of probably was standing up trying to uh, flap his wings, test out, do some exercise and unfortunately probably just lost his balance and fell out of the nest. <laughs> now, now thankfully he wasn't injured, there were no problems with him and the parents actually were working to both protect him and actually continue to feed him even though he was on the ground. It's not the ideal situation because obviously he's more at risk for predation. Um, you would have fox, coyotes, other uh, predators in the area. So that's why even though the parents were trying to protect him and take care of him and feed him on the ground, we're actually going to reunite him and put him back in the nest because that's the safest spot for him. And if you notice, all of our staff here, Jacob, our technician, and that are wearing safety gloves, okay, because he is an owl and he does have very sharp talons, which uh, can definitely do some damage. So, and he also has a mask on. And you notice this room, we normally keep the lights dim and we, mi we minimize human contact with the owls. Um, and that'll help prevent these birds from getting imprinted or habituated to, uh, to uh, people so they can be successfully put back out in the wild. All right, so if he's done, why don't we wrap him up again and put him back in his enclosure. It's a uh, behavioral physiologic process where birds, um, as well as other animals, um, learn to develop their sense of self, okay, like what they are. And so what normally, usually, happens is that when these birds are born the first thing they see is their parents okay and that's what they associate themselves with now the problem you know potential problems occur is when they're orphaned and the first thing they don't see is their parents but instead they see people and instead of associating themselves as a sense of self or what they are is an owl they can potentially develop um, they will view humans as potential mates or as potential rivals, um, which obviously can create uh, human-animal conflicts, um, especially with something as big and potentially harmful as a great horned owl. It is another one of our native owl species here in New England. Uh, this is, as you guys can obviously see, it is a slightly smaller uh, owl species compared to the great horned owl, which is uh, one of our bigger owl species. These guys actually come in uh, two different colors, which is very interesting. This guy is what we would call a gray phase eastern screech owl. Uh, we also have the red phase eastern screech owls, which have like a dark red, uh, burnt umber, orange kind of color to them. So what they're doing here is they're trying to get him to tong feed and uh, accept some uh, food. Being a little fussy, but that's fine. We'll get him to eat. Sometimes they just take a little bit more effort. So if he's totally not into it, Connor, what you can do is you can kind of pull down on his throat a little bit and we'll just get one piece in his mouth. So if you need to, go ahead and put the yogurt cup down. Uh, there you go. And actually just get it in his mouth. And then once he starts eating it there. So owls in general perform a really important function in our ecosystem, especially here in New England. They are carnivores, they are predators, and they do a fantastic job uh, keeping down the rodent or the pest population. Um, a lot of these owls um, will actually keep down the mice and other rodent populations, which is a huge uh, beneficial uh, job that will definitely help out people. Um, they help reduce uh, incidents of pest damage in like farming um, sites, as well as uh, food storage areas, agricultural areas. They also help prevent disease transmission because you do have some uh, rodents which can transmit disease. So all of that, both from a public safety as well as a uh, health standpoint, um, are hugely beneficial to people. And they do so without having to resort to toxic uh, rodenticides, which have a lot of problems and end up affecting um, both people, 
pets as well as wildlife and yeah. causing a lot of problems. So this is nature's way. These are uh, part of nature's uh, pest control system, which uh, have a huge beneficial impact for uh, humanity. And these guys, the eastern screech owl by himself, um, a lot of these owls, one, th uh, one issue we see with these guys is uh, this particular species, they tend because they're a smaller owl, they tend to eat a fair bit of insects. Okay, and unfortunately, insects are attracted to lights such as street lamps and car lights. So we see a fair bit of these uh, animals coming in with head and eye trauma, unfortunately, because they end up playing in traffic, trying to catch their prey. So we end up having to deal with a lot of those issues. But thankfully, we've been able to help a lot out and get them back out into the wild. So this owl, again, we are feeding, at this particular time, we're actually feeding them mice bits as well. However, we do vary his diet. We try to mimic their diets as much as possible to what they get in the wild. So this guy actually will be fed insects as well. We kind of change up and like mix up the diet to give as much variety as possible. The proper procedure as to what uh, members of the public should do if they find owls or any other injured or sick uh, wildlife is generally speaking we recommend people don't approach wildlife um, depending on the particular animal they can be dangerous uh, they can carry disease all right so we usually recommend you contact your local animal control officer who you can reach through the non-emergency number in your local police department um, in addition, uh, the other some other resources available, the uh, state environmental police um, for uh, certain issues, as well as uh, or, uh, nonprofit humanitarian organizations like Animal Rescue League. All right, and then what happens is those organizations will actually um, assess the situation, determine if that animal needs to be uh, helped. And if they are, and if they are, uh, if they do find them to be injured, sick, or orphaned, then they actually will bring them to organizations like ourselves uh, here at New England Wildlife Center uh, here in Weymouth, where we can actually provide the medical expertise uh, to deal with those problems and get the animals back to um, a healthy point where they're actually able to be released. Uh, successfully released back in the wild and survive in the wild without any further human intervention because that's that's the goal is to get everybody back out into the wild he's actually been eating really well he just um, so this is their morning okay so he might he, he might just be a little bit sleepy he actually does he's actually already eaten a, a fair bit of his food mm -hmm. and he actually eats really well in the evening which is when these guys would be yeah. waking up we just feed them twice a day so we can actually get enough calories into him to make sure that, that he keeps growing. But he's actually been doing really well. He actually, this guy, um, unlike the gray horned owl, actually came in very sick. So what happened was a member of the public called, uh, they were concerned about him. They had found him on their deck, actually. And when, they, when this animal was brought in, he was severely dehydrated to the point that he was going into shock and potentially dying. Um, he was uh, not able to stand, he was extremely weak, he wasn't really responsive, he was only responsive to uh, painful stimuli, so he was, he, he, he was having a lot of problems. So as a result of that, we ended up uh, doing some um, pretty aggressive fluid therapy. We were actually were able to rehydrate him and get him uh, fluids and electrolytes um, by giving him what we call sub-Q fluids or subcutaneous fluids, which means we'll actually give fluids underneath the skin. Um, it's a common way in wildlife rehab medicine to rehydrate wildlife. It's cheap, it's easy, and it's pretty effective. And as you can see, this guy's actually doing much better. Not only is he awake, he's active, he's bright, he's alert, but he's actually feeding well and he's actually been consistently gaining weight, which is always a good sign. That's one of the things we always look for in these juveniles um, to make sure that they're actually doing well. We used our skills, our expertise, and our equipment here at New England Wildlife Center to actually make sure that we dealt with the medical problems that this animal had, and then we provide the follow-up husbandry and nutritional care, which will actually ensure that he's in good enough health to be successfully fostered and put back in another uh, nest so he can go and you know fulfill uh, you know finish out his natural life cycle and do what he's supposed to be doing which is being an owl out in the wild.
So what we do here is New England Wildlife Center, one of our, our primary mission is to educate people about wildlife and conservation issues here in New England. And one of the ways we do that is we provide hands-on education for all sorts of categories of people, all sorts of uh, members of the public. So we deal with anything from uh, school groups, we deal with primary school, secondary school, high school students, the vast majority of our caretakers here, the people that actually do the daily work um, and care for the animals and you know deal with everything we deal with here at the center are all undergraduate college students, which is part of our um, excellent internship program. And we also do uh, training for uh, the local vet tech programs as well as veterinary students. Uh, from around the country and in fact around the world. We've actually had international students as well. And so we provide um, all these different categories of people um, as well as like the Norfolk Aggie students which is a uh, agricultural uh, technical uh, high school in the area. We provide them hands-on skills and you can see one of the students here is actually the one feeding the owl. Um, we work with uh, the Norfolk County Jail to provide um, pre-release prisoners with um, hands-on skill training in that um, and uh, animal care expertise uh, so they can actually have a set of job skills when they uh, get out. Uh, we work with uh, local schools uh, with uh, children that have physical, emotional, and mental handicaps and we connect them with uh, both nature and wildlife and teach them about conservation issues here in New England. So the whole education aspect is, uh, is integrated into everything we do here. Let's just uh, clean his mouth off, guys, so, we don't, so, so he doesn't have the blood. That way he won't get an uh, uh, infection going on there. Keep him clean, and then we'll just mark everything up. Mark his chart, and he is good to go. You guys did a great job. He, he, he ate everything, right? He did. Sweet. Good job. So this guy is well on his way to uh, being successfully released um, and fostered out into another nest and where he'll uh, finish off his life. Both of these guys, um, the current plan is to either reunite them in their original nest or foster them in another nest and they're going to be leaving here um, sometime this weekend most likely. So we are in the center's uh, noisy baby ward as we affectionately call it. And this is the room where all of our uh, orphaned and juvenile baby birds end up um, before they are too young to fly and when they are still being syringe fed. You can see we've uh, inserted her into a surrogate knitted nest um, with some paper towels. And he's getting syringe fed a uh, special bird formula. And this will happen every 30 minutes for about the next 10 hours. Um, and Probably by this time next month, we'll have maybe 20 to 30 birds in here. Um, so you can imagine if each one needs to get fed every 30 minutes, by the time you finish feeding the line, you're literally starting right back um, over again. And it's, a, it's an arduous process, but um, you know it has to be done. We're trying to replicate the same sort of feeding schedule as a mother would have in the wild. This particular robin was admitted, uh, I believe about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks. Um, and he's just growing <laughs> very fast, very rapidly. It's uh, every morning you'll come in and you'll look at him and you go, oh my God, I can't believe that's the same bird. Um, and you can see he'll, uh, it takes a little coaxing to get in there, but he'll start gaping eventually um, when he gets a taste of the formula. And then she'll uh, insert the syringe and, and slowly start to feed. It depends on the species. Uh, we keep them until they have uh, full flight feathers um, and then we'll flight test them. So we'll actually take them outside, let them get some exercise, make sure they can fly, um, do accurate turns, um, and then we'll do an exit exam on them. If everything looks good, um, we'll release them. But I would say the average time is uh, probably on the order of six weeks for a lot of these guys. These would be the guys you see out in your yard uh, foraging for worms, um, hopping around on the ground. This particular bird um, went through an all too common process. Uh, which was uh, people start doing tree work in the spring to get their house ready, um, landscaping. And unfortunately, the tree these guys lived in, or this guy lived in, was cut down and the nest was destroyed. Um, so next to the fallen tree, a uh, family, a local family, found this bird and were able to recover him 
bring them to us and uh, uh, we're able to place them in here. And uh, this time of year, unfortunately, is uh, probably our most common admission, is nest destroyed, nest falls out of the tree. Um, but the thing we always tell people is make sure the bird is really um, in trouble and really on its own before you gather them up. Because with all young animals, they are trying new things out and uh, sometimes they're just learning to fly and it doesn't always work the first time. Or sometimes mom is nearby actually feeding. Um, people have a tendency to sometimes pick them up prematurely and bring them to us. Um, when mom is still around and, and still could do the job better than um, we can do it in the hospital. So you always want to make sure when you're getting a wild animal that you, uh, um, that he's not just uh, you know, out there and mom's not around somewhere. This time of year, it really sort of depends on, uh, on the month and the year. Um, this is a little strange year for us. Usually we would have more admissions by now, but um, at the moment, the American Robin is sort of the most common we have. We have a lot of starlings this time of year as well, uh, rock doves and uh, chickadees as well. It's not always uh, easy to tell. Um, a lot of times it takes some observation. Um, and what I mean by that is you don't want to necessarily, if you see a bird, you don't want to immediately scoop it up. The best thing you can do is wait a little bit, observe from a distance, um, see if mom is around, uh, look for the nest. And you can also look at how um, large the bird is and if he has all of his feathers. You can see he's sort of got traces of yellow um, and you can see through to his skin on his chest there. Um, these are still his, his primary um, feathers and they will, uh, as he fledges, um, they'll grow in. So it's a good way to assess to see how old they are. A lot of times moms, depending on the species, will only come back a few times a day and oftentimes that is uh, in the early morning or later at night. Um, so it is a difficult process, but we tell people, um, you know, give it, a, give it a solid day. And you can usually tell if a bird is injured or if it's just, uh, you know, trying to learn how to be a bird. <laughs> These guys are, you know, very curious and um, yeah, it's not an easy process being out there for the first time on your own. Once these guys have been flight tested, we'll take them out to one of our larger uh, enclosed cages and we will let them try to spread their wings, see what the lift looks like. Um, and we like to have them turn a corner in the cage if we can, so we can make sure they maneuver. Um, and once they pass their flight test, then they can go back out. Um, and these guys, we generally try to return them to uh, where they came from or a uh, legal and safe, you know, protected area where they're gonna be. Um, you know, have enough food and protection and the right habitat, and things like that. But there's, there's really nothing like, uh, you know, letting a bird go after you've worked on them for a month, two months, something like that, and watching them go back to the wild. We always try not to get attached. We don't name any of our animals for that reason. Um, but as you can see, these guys have personalities and it is, you know, <laughs> well, we never want them to get attached to us. It is hard for us not to get attached to them, especially when you're hand feeding them for, <laughs> for weeks and watching them grow. Probably one of the more common birds in Massachusetts. Um, these are the kind of birds, if you went into your backyard and looked up, you may um, hear them and you may recognize that, that signature uh, chirping they're doing. Um, usually on a nice spring, summer day, you can hear that outside. Um, these guys came in together from the same nest, as you can see. And they're a little older than the robins are. Um, and you can tell by the, the feathering on, the, on their head and um, on their backs. You can also see these guys are a little hungrier than the, the robins were too. <laughs> Um, and that calling is, is a, uh, a signature move and that lets mom know they're, they're hungry. And it's, uh, that's why we call it noisy baby ward actually because by the time this room fills up there's a, <laughs> a deafening chirp going on <laughs> of, of hungry babies. And certainly while they're in the nest, they do. Um, if they met in the wild a month later, I'm not sure they would know anymore. Um, but you have to realize they're living in a very close space. Um, in most cases, they will hatch um, within days of each other. Um, and they are all looking for, this, for mom. So they actually work as a unit to call for food sometimes, um, keep each other warm, certainly in the nest as well. Our internship program is probably entering its 20th year, I would say, thereabouts. Um, and each year we train around 50 undergraduate, graduate, um, and sometimes even postgraduate interns in our hospital. These guys come from schools um, all over the country and internationally. And usually about uh, eight to 16, eight to 20 week internships for school credit. Um, and we actually have uh, four dormitories upstairs as well and uh, facilities so we can house them um, to 
depending on what part of the country they're from. And these guys are working right in the hospital. They jump right in, they're working alongside vets, vet techs, um, learning all sorts of husbandry, diagnostics, um, feeding, dosing, um, the full gamut of, of veterinary care. It's one of the, the really unique and special things about our internship is, is that we're able to um, get them in there and be so hands-on. Um, so as they go on to vet school and pursue other careers, they have a really good stepping stone into the, into the field. Okay, so these guys, um, unfortunately, were probably a case where they were uh, removed uh, prematurely. Um, and, and believe me, we put no fault on, on the people who bring them in. They're, they're simply doing the best they can for the animals. Um, we always try to educate people to, you know, wait as long as you can, be really cautious and make sure that what you have is actually an animal in need of care and that mom's not there. Um, I think these, uh, they didn't see mom in the nest for a little bit and they, they removed it. We always try to return them as long as it's um, legal and safe for them to go back. Um, but generally, due to, you know, the population dynamics, if they can go back, um, near to where they came from, they, they're going to have a good shot at, um, you know, starting a, starting a healthy and happy uh, life in the wild. There are sometimes you get animals that are removed um, from their habitats because of construction, things like that. You obviously don't want to put them back in an, an active construction site. Um, then of course there are animals that, um, you know, are state regulated um, and they like to keep a close eye on it and um, we'll always check in with the commissioner of Fish and Wildlife and associated agencies to make sure that um, you know, everything's good to go and, and uh, things are working as they should. When you admit an animal, we ask you to fill out some paperwork, um, including the circumstances in which you found the animal. Um, and I, I'm not saying that I know for sure these are removed prematurely, um, but I know they, I believe they took the nest out of a tree in this case. Um, unless you see mom and you know that the mom is, is either sick or has perished in some way, um, then it's always, it's always best to leave it. Probably the three most common things we see are car strikes, um, this time of year, lawn care and landscaping, for sure. Um, and in other cases, uh, cat attacks. Um, something on the order of a billion birds a year are, are taken in by cat cats every year. Um, nothing against house cats either, but it's, uh, you know, they are, they're bred to hunt and, and they do that. Um, so we, at this time of year, especially when the babies are out there, they're vulnerable. Uh, they're not as quite as capable to escape the situation. We'll get a lot of cat and dog um, related admissions. This is a, uh, a bird starter mix. Um, you know, it's high in protein, electrolytes, I believe. We adjust their diet as they get older um, and they will eventually get onto solid food. Um, you know, so according to their weight, our physical exam will, will adjust their nutritional support a little bit one way or the other to, you know, to meet their specific needs. They'll get this probably, in these guys' case, for uh, another two weeks, I would say. Um, and the solid food is uh, generally when they stop gaping, when they're a little stronger, a little bigger, uh, moving around freely. We'll move them to larger mesh cages where they have a little room to actually start to fly and, uh, and hop around. And at that point, we usually switch them over. He is relatively young, and he was found wandering um, amongst the shops and buildings. Um, people who found him knew something wasn't right, um, and he was a little bit uh, disoriented and dehydrated. 
you come in and what you're looking at right now is they're administering fluid support. Um, just like you would get fluids at the hospital, um, we're giving them to him. You will also get nutritional support um, and enrichment while he is here. Um, but right now we're concentrating on getting him strong and healthy. Um, and he will also get vaccinated later this afternoon. Um, okay. And what they're about to administer now is an oral medication. Um, it's a dewormer uh, to make sure he doesn't have any parasites. Uh, much like you would do with a, a new puppy, you do that occasionally. Um, you do that with these guys as well. Unfortunately, this stuff, uh, from what I've heard, does not taste great, but it will uh, certainly help them in the long run. And you can see uh, when they wrap him, we call this a burrito technique. Um, we keep the head covered, keep the body covered, and uh, this keeps them a little, little less stressed and it's great for transport. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Okay. So he will be in here until he regains his strength, at which point he'll go out to a, a much larger enclosure outside um, where he'll get to run around and. Uh, you know, wants to save room to do so. Boxes are very cool, very uh, cute, and they're fun to work with. However, um, they're challenging. Um, they're very smart animals, um, and they're very messy animals. Um, so, you know, it literally means cleaning four or five times a day. Um, you're feeding probably minimum uh, two to three times a day, plus the medications. You really have to keep a close eye on them. Um, that being said, it is very gratifying when you can get uh, an identifiable animal like a fox back out to the wild. And uh, generally we only get one or two of these a year, so this is a, a pretty cool experience for us when we get them. My first piece of advice would be to keep a safe distance. Um, in general, you're not really going to see foxes um, in the wild unless you're catching a passing glimpse in the woods or something. Um, in a case like this where he's in a public area, um, sort of listing side to side, and uh, not really uh, shying away from people. That's generally a good sign uh, that something might be up. And the best thing you can do is call your local animal control, animal rescue league, or you can call our front desk directly and we can advise you from there. Um, we always try to work on a case by case basis. So this is Hector, and he is uh, prepping this little uh, little raccoon uh, for his daily feeding, um, of which he will have, I believe, three today. Uh, these guys are, as you can see, incredibly squirmy, incredibly playful, um, very interactive animals. Um, and it's exactly for that reason they are so hard to care for. Um, and in the same regard, they also come with a number of public health concerns that are certainly nothing to be worried about, but we always have to be cognizant of and always have to take extra precaution uh, to accommodate. So you'll see the raccoons uh, in our hospital, they get their own room, they have their own outdoor caging, um, and that is in particular because they are little escape artists, and you can see how dexterous um, their hands are. If you look in close, they actually have the most finely tuned sense of touch um, of any of the animals around here, for sure. And they will actually um, sometimes be able to pick at locks, open cages, um, and escape. So we always have to be very careful to uh, keep a close eye on them. And then also raccoons, of course, can carry uh, rabies, uh, distemper, and a parasite called raccoon roundworm, uh, which uh, can unfortunately be fatal to humans. The risk factor is very low. Um, it has to come from ingesting their feces. But, um, what that means is if you have little kids at home and you find a raccoon in your attic or something like that, um, you definitely want to deal with that immediately. Um, and you can always call our front desk for advice on how to deal with it. But you never want to leave uh, a, a raccoon in contact with small children um, or, or really any member of your family.
Um, so you see raccoons actually have th um, uh, semi-opposable thumbs and um, the way they tell their food is safe is they pick it up and they turn it over and they touch it. Um, so in the evolutionary process of developing the skills to do that, they have also become really good at um, uh, picking things apart and they can actually grab things with two hands and, and unlatch cages. And I'll tell you a quick funny story. We, um, we underwent a capital campaign two years ago and a part of that we built this really beautiful new outdoor raccoon cage. Extremely excited about it. Um, it had all sorts of enrichment gear and a ton of space for them to run around and we had the contractors build it um, to what we believe was absolutely raccoon proof and we really, really re over reinforced it. So, had the grand opening, released the first raccoons into it, came back outside 10 minutes later and there were six raccoons sitting on the roof of the cage. And they had immediately picked the lock and made it up. So we had to go back in. Luckily we were able to gather them all up, put them back and, and made some adjustments. But uh, yeah, they never, <laughs> never cease to surprise us at, at how creative and uh, crafty they are. Um, so what you're seeing is he's getting tube fed right now. Um, he's getting formula uh, through a, a soft rubber tube that will go right down his um, right down his throat. And they are slowly pushing that in. And you can see he's uh, <laughs> he's chomping on it. And he's he's probably used to this routine by now. Um, and this is how. It, yep. And this is again just like the baby birds. We're trying to mimic um, as much of the natural husbandry as we can. Um, this is part of that, and until they get a little older, then they'll start eating a mix of uh, fruits and dog foods and fish and mice and all, all that good stuff. Now, I noticed that in this case, the gloves are just small plastic ones. Are they not likely to bite animals that they're familiar with? Uh, no, they are. Um, these guys, we will often wear uh, these thick uh, gauntlets. In this case, Hector. Uh, has become very skilled at what he is doing, um, and they ca they can absolutely bite. These guys are all rabies vaccinated, um, but it is always important that we take uh, you know take the appropriate precautions. As they get older, though, it certainly becomes more risky to uh, do that, and then we always always wear the big big leather gloves. And you can see the way he he picks them up. It's using the the. Uh, He'll scruff them, just like mom would do in the wild. Um, that's that sort of flap in the back, uh, skin in the back of their neck. Um, you're able to transport them that way if you're not using the towel technique. Oh, I mean, it, it, uh, it sort of incapacitates them temporarily when mom picks them up like that. they're going to get a weight on him. And we get uh, daily weights on these guys in addition to the physical exam. Um, an increase, a weight gain um, is sort of one of our best measures of health um, in these guys. So you can see his chart goes back about maybe two weeks of daily weighings and he is uh, good. <laughs> Look like a pretty linear, linear curve on him. He's, he's gaining weight really fast. Um, these guys get a couple daily feedings, I believe 6% uh, of their body weight, right guys? Yeah, yeah so they're getting about 6% of their body weight at each feeding. Um, and again, this is a special formula um, that is just loaded with uh, protein and uh, vitamins and things that uh, a growing animal would need. Um, this is obviously the, the fastest uh, time of growth for them. So they, they need extra support um, at this stage. Yeah. 
All right, so this will be. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. As Hector's saying, you can uh, they'll occasionally purr, uh, and it's probably because he knows he's about to get <laughs> about to get his breakfast. Um, but they are just in incredibly social animals, and it's really important that uh, they have the chance to interact with other raccoons at this age. And you can see even with Hector, he's uh, he's sort of uh, teasing him a little bit. Um, but in the summertime, when these guys get bigger, they'll get moved outdoors, and then we really focus on enrichment. So last year, one of the things we did is we set up a water slide for them. And we hit the hose on a slide, and they would literally spend hours running up the ladder and sliding down into a pool over and over again. Uh, we also give them a jungle gym, uh, all sorts of tubes they can climb through, and then uh, we give them what we call micicles, and we'll freeze uh, mice into, into icicles and they will, it will take them an hour or so to, to thaw it out and eat it. But it is one of their favorite things. Uh, <laughs> things. Oh, you did? Uh, so they've already gotten a little bit of that already. <laughs> um, and the great thing about raccoons is that they, they bond really well with, with other raccoons. Um, so if we can get some around the same age, we can actually put them together and they'll sort of accept each other into the, into the clan. Yep, you can see them now, already. Uh, I can find out, give me one second. Uh, do you guys know how these guys came in? Okay. Um, so these guys, um, were admitted uh, by Animal Rescue League, which is how we get a, a good portion of our admissions. Um, my best guess is that mom was probably hit on the road by a car, which is an all too common scenario here for us. Um, as a result, the babies are left, and uh, you can see the level of care it takes to, to get them back out to the wild, so we have to step in at that point. Um, but they are all, I'm happy to report, healthy at this time. They're really just in need of, uh, you know, normal uh, feeding, cleaning, um, and of course we deworm all of them as well. Um, reasonably common scenario for us. These guys up top here uh, came on a logging truck. Uh, I'm sure somebody was doing some tree work, forestry work, or, or falling some timber. Took a shipment of logs um, from where it was, somewhere in Massachusetts, and then later found that there had been, uh, you know, seven or eight raccoons right along with it. Um, and in that case, mom's, you know, states away, unfortunately. Um, so we'll have to step in and, and provide care for them. Raccoons, you can see how social they are, how identifiable and cute they are. Um, if you find a raccoon, um, you really, really should not approach it, not try to gather it up, not touch it. Um, unfortunately, with the rabies risk factors, if you expose or you were exposed to a raccoon bite or you get too close, um, unfortunately they have to be rabies tested. So the best thing you can do is you find a raccoon you think is in a situation that might not be right, um, either call us, call Animal Control, um, call Animal Rescue League, um, but consult a professional. It will protect the raccoons and it will protect you um, and it will end up being a much better situation than if you, if you try to uh, pick them up yourself. We're living in a time where the, the lines between the natural world and our world are, are blurred and intersecting. Um, but in order to preserve what we can, we always, you know, you have to let nature be nature. And sometimes it's a hard lesson to learn, it's a hard thing to watch, but it, it really is best for the animals and it's, it's best for us as well. Okay, um, so we're in the New England Wildlife Center's uh, medical ward right now. He's a male and he was recovered um, not able to fly, um, and he was, his head was listing to one side, uh, which is usually a sign of neurologic trauma. Upon further testing, we realized that he was likely suffering from rodenticide poisoning, um, which is a form of rat poison. And in the last two, three years, this has become um, an incredibly common problem and an incredibly uh, troublesome problem for us. 
what happens a lot of the time is people will have mice in their house and of course want to get rid of them and they'll put out these uh, poison traps and occasionally a mouse, a rat will go in, take a dose of that poison, leave and not die right away. So then what you end up with is a slow moving mouse that is a great uh, easy lunch for somebody like him. And he'll eat the mouse, get the dose of rat poison himself, um, and in some cases actually do this four or five times um, before succumbing. Um, and what happens is the poison is an anticoagulant, so it'll stop the blood from clotting. So um, I think in this guy's case, he came in, he was actually bleeding from his nose and his eyes. Um, so we have to hit him right away with a treatment of vitamin K and some other supportive drugs. Um, and that will usually, um, over time, begin to uh, repair itself. And he's actually doing much, much better than he was when he came in. And the way this is going to work is they have him burritoed, much like the raccoons. In a bird, you have it on its back, its head covered, it's a low stress and uh, low movement position. Um, and you can see they're pulling out his right leg. Um, which is, uh, you know, the optimal spot to give fluids. There's some more, more of a neurologic thing. Um, there's also some speculation he may have had some head trauma by the time he got in. Um, unfortunately, in these kind of cases, one thing leads to another. If you're not feeling well, you're not flying right, it's very easy for you to slam into something or in some cases get hit by a car or something like that. Um, and so often is the case, we never are only treating one problem in these animals. It's sort of, they get into trouble, that leads to more trouble, and then before you know it, they're in really rough shape and they end up uh, coming in here. Um, so you can see he's, uh, he's getting fluids. So the red tail is definitely the most common around here, um, characteristic uh, reddish-brown tail feathers, um, which you'll see. They do look similar to the, the Cooper socks and occasionally the broad wings, um, but they have that really distinctive call, which is one of the best ways to know that sort of uh, the call you hear in movies they assign to uh, every bird of prey ever is actually the red tail call. Um, and you can see also his, uh, his marbling and coloration right there on his, on his stomach. Um, so Priya is uh, sterilizing right now um, before the injection. And he will, is he getting meloxicam also? Okay. okay. So meloxicam is a uh, anti-inflammatory amongst other things. Um, and the worry in head trauma is maybe you have some brain swelling, something like that, and it will, uh, it will help with that. These are all s sort of supportive, supportive medications. Um, you can see that he is a little feisty right now, um, which is actually a great sign for us. Um, when you have an animal that's supposed to be in the wild, not used to being around people, generally um, feistier, the angrier they are, is letting us know they're getting ready to go, and we can get them out of here sooner, which is, which is great for everybody. Yeah, how can um, make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen to prevent toxins from getting rat poison? Um, well, unfortunately, using an alternative type of trap, either um, trapping live or um, certainly the snap traps are a little gruesome, but they do sort of eliminate this problem. Um, unfortunately, there's a new generation of rat poisons out there that were supposed to be a little more environmentally friendly, and unfortunately, if had the opposite effect. Um, but I will say, if you're going to live trap a mouse, make sure that he's at least two miles away from your house when you let him go, or else he'll, he might beat you home. Uh, they are. Um, the biggest threat to these guys is uh, far and away humans. Um, you can imagine it's great for these guys to hunt right along roadways where there's untrimmed grass. So, you know, along a busy highway, something like that, you'll have an area that hasn't been mowed in a while. Perfect environment for uh, mice, voles, uh, little rodents that make great food for them. And sometimes in the pursuit of their food, they'll cross a roadway, get hit by a car, get that a lot. Um, the uh, rat poison or uh, rodenticide, rodenticide toxicosis, certainly a big issue. Um, and we actually have a hawk right now with lead poisoning as well. Um, and that is probably more a function of it moving up the food chain than it was him actually ingesting lead. But um, yeah, generally a human, human driven uh, problems. So the med ward is um, sort of the first stop for a lot of our animals. We don't keep um, 
really any mammals in here generally. This is mostly the birds, um, occasionally some reptiles, uh, things like that. But this is sort of the after admission, they'll come in, we'll do an initial assessment. This is where you get the broken wings, broken legs, um, the toxicosis, things like that. They'll come in here, get put in a smaller cage, um, which at first, if you're in rough shape, you're not feeling well, having a, a large area that you feel like you have to protect um, isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, so we give them a nice, quiet, calm space. We usually keep it dark in here. Um, and this is sort of the intensive care until they can uh, begin to get better. And then of course, as soon as they're ready, we'll take them outside, bigger enclosures, slowly sort of wean them up to being in the flight cage out back, um, at which point they'll start regaining their strength, flying again, um, and we'll actually help them do laps around our big flight cage out back. And I think our rule is, what do you guys do, like 10 laps a day? Or for the, when they're outside? About 10 laps, um, sort of the sweet spot for, for exercise for these guys. Um, and then when they're ready, they'll, they'll go out and be released. Unfortunately for this guy, uh, the rat poison is, is a long-term long -term process. We actually had one hawk admitted in January of last year, and he was just released two months ago. Um, so you can imagine the amount of resources, time, money, diagnostics that go into treating just a single animal. Um, and you know, as a nonprofit, we don't get any state or federal funding to do this. We depend on you know our community that we're trying to serve to help us out um, in return. So if you'd like to donate, if you'd like to help any of these animals, you can go to anywildlife.org, um, which is our website. And please, we encourage anybody in the area, in the community, come and see us. We're open seven days a week. We have a nature center. We'd love to show you around. Um, and if you'd like to volunteer, we'd love to get you involved too.